you do have your Bible, we're going to be continuing uh, our journey through the book of Romans. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 2. We're going to be covering uh, verses 1 through 16. And this morning's message is titled, Men's Judgment versus God's Judgment. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 2. You know, there's no break between Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. It's a continuation of the thought that we covered last week. And Paul paints a very frightful picture of men's sinfulness, as we covered last week. And in chapter 2, Paul shows us that this sinful picture is equally true for uh, the Jewish people, even though they were God's chosen people, they're God's own nation, uh, because they were actually practicing the same things as the Gentiles were practicing in chapter 1. And uh, because they were practicing the same things, they were just as guilty. And so Paul paints this picture of our state and the depravity of men. And then as you read in context in the book of Romans, then God gives us the grace of God and what he saved us from. But we need to understand where we are and what we will be without the Lord. And he does give a way out. If we only had the way out, then we never really understood how depraved or how sinful we can become without the Lord. And uh, we would never really appreciate God saving us. We would kind of look at Jesus that what he did on the cross was just a common thing, like, oh, no big deal. But the more we realize who we really are, the more we appreciate who he really is and what he's done for us. Many times, after committing a crime, a man will try to make an excuse to justify what he has done. As he gives you his explanation, he sounds like he's really innocent. However, sometimes people make up the story after the fact to justify and to avoid their punishment. Have you seen that guy at the grocery store who took a bottle of iced tea and he opened it and he drank and the store clerk busted him on camera like, hey, you can't do that. You got to pay for that. And uh, he, cl- he put the lid back on and he said, no, this is flat. Like, I'm not buying this drink. It's flat. And, uh, and the people are like, no, you opened it. You got to buy it. And so they had this back and forth. And he's like, I'm not buying it. It's flat. It's not, it doesn't taste good. <laughs> and, um, you know, he puts it back and they kind of go back and forth, uh, puts it back in the fridge. Uh, so he's claiming that the drink was flat and that he's not paying for this drink. And so they basically argue with each other and he walks out of the store. Where God tells Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 8 through 12, God tells Ezekiel, dig a hole through the wall and go in and take a look around the house of Israel. So Israel went in and what um, Ezekiel went in and what Ezekiel saw, he saw many filthy pictures. He saw detestable animals and he saw idols upon the wall. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, you're seeing the insides of men's minds. This is what's going on. God, God showed Ezekiel what's going on through our minds. But see, the Bible teaches that everything is open in the eyes of the Lord. We cannot hide from the Lord, not even the motives of our hearts. We can't hide our motives. Whatever we do in our heart, God knows. So based on that, when God makes a judgment call or when God judges, He judges with the perfect judgment. Because he's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows the motive of our hearts. He knows our, the reason why we did it. And so we can take confidence, the Bible teaches, that God's judgment is with absolute perfection. It's with absolute truth. Now the idea in this chapter is that human judgment is often impaired. Our judgment is limited because we're limited. We don't possess the omniscience of God. And man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. So when God judges, he judges with the righteous judgment. And so here in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Paul continues and he says, Therefore, you are inexcusable. You are without excuse, O men, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever judgment you judge another, you're actually condemning yourself. For you who judge, you're practicing the exact same things. So here Paul forbids the Roman Christians, and he forbids us today, from judging other people. And this is because when we declare that we know right from wrong, then we're basically declaring that 
we know when we do wrong as well. And it's immediately making us guilty before God because none of us have lived a perfect life without sin. And so we might have done different sins, but the Bible says that sin is still sin. And sin separates us from God. That's why Jesus came to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And he was nailed to a wooden cross and he bled and his body was broken for you and for me. Now, when we judge other people's sins, we're actually sinning. It's actually a sin to judge other people's sins. And so when we judge other people's sins, we're actually sinning ourselves. And we are also setting up the standard by which we will be judged. So we, we kind of decide the standard. The way we judge people or don't judge people, that's exactly what's going to happen to our life. So we decide what kind of judgment that we're going to receive by the way we treat other people and by the way we judge or don't judge other people. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful in Matthew chapter 5, for they shall receive mercy. And so it's just a matter of time till me and you are in that place and we just want, God, just be merciful to me. Just be merciful to me. And God's going to give us opportunities to be in the other side where it's somebody else that's begging for mercy. And then it's our decision in our hearts. Are we going to be merciful to this person or are we going to sin by judging them? So it's within mine and yours own interest to be merciful to people around us because we also want to receive mercy ourselves because at times we are guilty as well. So in a sense, we're the ones that set the tone for our own lives based on how we handle and how we deal with other people. And the Bible says, choose life that you may live. Today, as we all know, it is Father's Day. And how many fathers in the world from time to time have dealt with, the, with their kids in a certain way, in a certain moment, later to just find out that the kid kind of took the dad's example, does exactly the same thing that the dad did. And then when you see a kid do it, you're like, whoa, that's not actually the way it's supposed to go. But when you look at the kid, you actually look in a little mirror, you actually see yourself, right? And that, that goes for all parents, right? And you realize, okay, I fell short. Obviously, he's doing exactly what I did. And when I did it, I thought I was right. But now as he's doing it to a sibling or something, it's obviously not okay. So it's interesting how we're able to identify our own sins into other people, right? But when it comes to us, we give ourselves a pass, right? And so the Bible teaches, as we give ourselves a pass, that we're to give other people a pass as well. And we set the tone for our kids, and they will reflect back exactly what we do not necessarily what we pray. You know, ministry is most often, more often caught than taught. You know, you see somebody in the skin, the way they uh, come and do ministry and the way they serve the Lord, and you see the parents, what they do. You know, you tell your kid, hey, don't do this. You know, and then they see you doing it, right? They're like, basically like, yeah, well, whatever. I didn't hear you, right? I saw you, right? So I'm going to see what you do, and I'm going to continue doing that because obviously it's not wrong for you, so you set the standard. How many times have you had your children, I know I have, they come up to you and they say, uh, Dad, why is it okay for you to do that? And you're like, well, uh, you're right, it's not okay. You're absolutely right, and praise God for that. You know, you're able to see it, that, uh, you know, we set a certain standard. Uh, but no, it is not right, I need to repent. And fathers, one of the best things you can do for your children is to repent in front of them. Are you going to mess up? Yes. But that's called, you're a human. Now, you don't live in a habitual sin and a lifestyle of sin, but if you can repent and you can tell your kids, you know what, daddy was actually wrong. You know, I lied. You know, uh, we went to, we went to um, Five Guys. And um, man, I always sin when I go to Five Guys. <laughs> I need to stay away from that place. Um, you know, I've only been to Five Guys like twice in my life. Um, but uh, we went there and, uh, you know, I'm reading and... Uh, I'm reading that they're going to put lettuce in your burger and tomatoes and mushrooms and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just so excited, you know, like, so, and I get my burger, it's just the bun, there's meat and there's another bun. And I'm like, well, who does that? You have to ask for lettuce. 
you have to ask for tomatoes? Like, I'm used to in and out, you know what I mean? You don't ask for that stuff, it comes in. And uh, so I didn't really realize I was complaining, you know, to my wife. But, you know, the kids are sponges. And I'm just like, man, I'm so disappointed. And, and plus, it was like $15 for one burger? <laughs> Panama City Beach is a tourist trap. <laughs> just got to cook at home and eat at home. I'm like, it was cheaper to eat in California. Um, so I'm complaining, and I'm not even like realizing I'm complaining, right? Which complaining is really bad, by the way. It's a bad sin. It's terrible. It's not like, yeah, complaining is cool. It's not cool at all. Complaining is really bad. And so, um, and so then the guy comes afterwards, you know, and he was an older gentleman, and I, you know, he was, and he's basically like, oh, how was, how was your burger, right? And he caught me off guard, and I was like, oh, it's good. Um, you know, I didn't want to hurt his feelings, and, and uh, you know, I felt bad for him because he was moving slow, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to, like, argue with the guy and give him a hard time, right? So I was like, you know, no problem. And uh, we came out of the restaurant uh, right here at Pier Park, and uh, my oldest, she's like, Daddy, why did you lie to that man? <laughs> And, um, you know, I reflected back on that, and I told her, you know, because I didn't want to hurt her, his feelings. What did I really teach my kid? It's okay to lie. You know, if, if, if somebody's feelings are more important than the Word of God, that's what I taught my kid. And so I had to go back. I had to go back, and I shared the story because I'm repented of it. <laughs> and uh, I went back, and I said, Madison, you know what? You're absolutely right. And you know what daddy did? Daddy sinned, and daddy lied, and daddy did something terrible. And uh, will you forgive me? Oh, yeah, that's fine, dad. <laughs> you know? And I've asked God to forgive me. Um, but what Satan wants in our flesh and the world, what they want to destroy us and tear us down, God's redemptive plan is so much stronger. And, and what we're, we're able to teach our kids is repentance. You know, don't answer, but dad, when is the last time you taught your kids repentance by repenting yourself in front of them? I think if you do that, there'll be times of refreshment from the Lord that will come. Go home and repent, repent in front of your kids, because I guarantee you, 50 to 100 years from now, you're going to be so happy when your own kid repents, because they're going to be making their own sins. So we are to be wise, and we're to ask the Lord to give us wisdom when it comes to judging other people, or when we decide to be merciful for other people in their situation and pray for other people that God would help them. I guarantee you that there will be a time in your life and in my life when we will be the ones messing up and we're going to be the ones that need hope and we're going to be the ones that are going to be crying out to God from the bottom of our hearts, God be merciful to me. You're praying for other people to forgive you. And when people around us treat us with kindness and mercy and goodness, then our relationship is restored back with the Lord. And our relationship is restored with the Lord and with other people. We are to put ourselves in other people's shoes and we're to consider things from their perspective. We really are to empathize with other people, uh, even with their weaknesses, because it's just a matter of time until 100% of us in a similar situation that our dear brother or sister is in from time to time are going to be in that exact situation ourselves. So when it's your turn, you're not hoping for judgment, you're hoping for mercy. So may the Lord help us to function with mercy and with the supremacy of the love of Jesus Christ in our minds and in our hearts as we deal with one another. Now remember uh, Nathan and David, you know, David had all the women he, had, he wanted. And God didn't want that, but David had that at his disposal. And uh, David had plenty of women, uh, but he saw Bathsheba, right? And he uh, sinned against the Lord, and he um, did wrong in the sight of the Lord. And so Nathan comes to David, and Nathan tells, the prophet Nathan tells David a story. And he says, hey David, there's this guy, and he's super rich. And he has a bunch of shit, sheep. And his neighbor is poor. And his neighbor has one, one little lamb. And this rich guy, he had a bunch. Uh, he had a, some, uh, some friends come over. 
and he wanted to uh, feed them some food and there was no uh, in and out drive through <laughs> so you had to prepare yourself and he said that rich guy instead of taking from his own sheep and blessing his guest he went to the neighbor and he took that neighbor's one little small little lamb killed it and fed his guest so david you're the king can you give me a judgment call in this situation david what should be done to that man and David immediately said, that rich man should surely be put to death. This is men's judgment. That guy needs to die because he did that. And then Nathan said, David, you are the man. Do you think David still wanted that man to die? <laughs> All of a sudden, wait, 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 wait. Let's make another judgment call because now it's me, right? If it's that guy, you know, he killed an animal, kill him. David, God said, you're the man. You destroyed the man, this man's life. And so, you just change the circumstances and the players around a little bit, and all of a sudden, you find yourself, you find me as the guilty party. What kind of judgment do we want? Also, when we take David's first attitude of self-righteousness, by being self-righteous, you're immediately making yourself guilty. And again, that's also sin against the Lord. And Satan loves that. Satan loves to see our brothers and sisters fall. And when we see our brothers and sisters fall, when we judge them because they fell, we're immediately making ourselves guilty as well. And so Satan gains more and more ground. Not only did your brother and sister in the Lord fall or sin, but now you judge them against God's will and now you became guilty too so you just gave more ground for the devil instead of taking ground for the Lord instead of being part of restoration instead of being part of praying for that person instead of bringing sending that person back on their feet so they can continue walking with the Lord now you just yielded to darkness not only darkness was in that person's life but now it's in your life as well and Satan loves that he loves to see us fall too He's like, hey, that's more ground for me. Why would we give any more darkness or any more ground to the enemy? And in verse 2 it says, But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against all those who practice such things. We know that the Lord is omniscient. He knows everything. And so when He judges, He knows everything about us. He knows our circumstances. He sees our actions that we perform. And it's even deeper than that. The Lord sees the attitude of our hearts. He's able to judge with perfect judgment. And God never makes a mistake when He judges. But we as people, fallible people, we're prone to make many mistakes. And we can't even judge right. I mean, look at our nation today. How many of our judges in the court system in America in 2024 do you really think they judge with right judgment? How many of them do you think they really had all the facts and had no ulterior motives and had no political agenda to do what they do. We don't know people's hearts. And so often just a judgment call that we make is based on partial information. And our decision making is only as good as our information gathering, right? David was, David's decision making is like death. Death needs to be the sentence of this crime. Well, you're that guy. Well, wait a minute. I got a little bit more information. <laughs> I got to make a different decision. Mercy, mercy. And David prays and he repents. And he says, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. David lost a lot of things. And uh, there were still consequences to his sin. Yes, he was forgiven, but all his kids rebelled against him. Crazy things has happened to his family on the kid's behalf because he gave that example to the kids. Yeah, he repented. Yeah, he was saved. But even that kid ended up dying with Bathsheba. Then the Lord gave him Solomon, and then the Lord was restoring, but there's still pain attached to that. But we don't know people's hearts. Many times we just judge based on partial information. If you want to be a mature Christian, and I know you do, this should be the desire of your heart, the desire of my heart. We need to come to terms with the fact that our judgment of our, uh, when we judge other people, is at best very faulty. We need to come to terms with that within ourselves. 
And for this reason, we cannot judge other people's hearts or the motives of their hearts. We don't have all the evidence like God does. And we are so easily influenced by other people. You know, somebody, the first, the first person to complain is usually right in our minds. You know, you're in the workplace and somebody comes and complains, hey, this is happening. And so he builds this, this storyline for you and you believe it as true, right? Because you're too lazy to investigate it. So you're like, oh, it's easy for me to do nothing just to believe this. But when the other person comes and shares their side of the story, they're like, well, wait a minute, I have more information. It's not exactly the way that person painted it, right? It's a little bit different. Our judgment, guys, is often clouded. And so we're really doing wrong by making a mistake. You know, I did have a, a conversation with Pastor Chuck Smith in his office. Not trying to throw any names out there or anything, but uh, praise God for that, that he gave me that. But I asked him a question, and I said, Pastor Chuck, there's this guy at Huntington Beach on a box who open air preaches. I was like, what do you think? Because, you know, we're Calvary Chapel, and we're basically focused on teach the word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, expositional preaching. Um, you know, there's not too many, like, Calvary Chapel guys that I know that just go on the street in a box and open air preach, right? Um, but other revivals, you know, have done that. So I was like, what do, you, what do you think about this guy? And Pastor Chuck said, he said, well, it depends on the motive of his heart. And that's all he said, and that was such a good answer. You know, because the focus is not on the action itself, like open air preaching. Is that from the Lord? Right. Is where is where was that man's heart? And where's going to be my heart when I do that? Is it to bring God glory or is it to be bring glory to myself? Right. So it's not what you're doing is what your motive behind it. And I love that. His answer was amazing because we don't know that man's heart. We don't know each other's hearts. The issue was not if we should be open air preachings or if we can do that, but the issue is where is our heart when we do that or do anything else to serve the Lord? Is it drawing attention to myself or is it drawing attention and bringing others to Jesus? Now, you might see two people doing the exact same thing. And it is possible that the heart of one is to glorify the Lord and the heart of the other doing the exact same thing is the heart to promote himself. David was a man after God's own heart. And only God could have seen inside of David's heart. And what did God see? That he's just like God. Did he make mistakes? Yes. But he's just like God. Therefore we sing, Change my heart, O God. You know that song? Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God. May I be like you. You are the potter, and I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. The Lord is the one that takes our heart of stone, and He's the one that transforms it into a heart of flesh. And do you think this, O oh men, Paul says, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same things, do you think that you're going to escape the judgment of God? The Bible says that it is appointed for men once to die, and then comes a the judgment. Judgment is coming. And we need to remind ourselves of that. But as Christians, you know, your sins have already been judged on the cross. They've been dealt with on the cross of Jesus. But if you're not a Christian here today, I will give you no false assurance that there is no judgment coming in your future. We love you, but you will be held accountable for all the sins that you've ever committed. And you will be judged and hell is in your future. However, the good news is, is that you can accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you can start walking with Him, and you can start being Christ-like, you can start being a Christian, you can start being merciful like He's merciful, you can start being forgiving like He's forgiven, you can start being non-judgmental like He didn't judge us, He didn't come to judge us, we were already condemned, He came to give us life, and that life more abundantly. And so do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So God leads people to turn and to repent of our sins and to turn to him. And the, the way he does it, he doesn't do it through wrath. He does it through his loving kindness. 
And so that's the ministry that we want to have as people too. When we talk to other people, we want to have a ministry of loving kindness. We want to lead people. Um, you know, you attract, uh, you know, you attract people for the Lord better with, uh, with honey than, uh, you know, just with the, the wrath of God. We have to be careful and not misinterpret God's goodness. Have you ever um, done something wrong, like you sinned, and you know you sinned, right? Like you already know, like, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this, but you're like, I'm just going to do it. Have you ever done that? I know you have, right? And then after you do it, you didn't get caught, right? And when you didn't get caught, you have to make a decision. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe this is okay for me to do. Or this was still wrong for me to do that, you know? Whenever I do those things, I feel so fearful. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like I didn't get caught. So what that means is I broke down my defenses. So next time when I'm around the same thing, I'm going to give in to it again. I'm going to give in. It's, hard, it's harder for me to resist. Every time I give in to whatever the sin is, I feel so fearful that God uh, didn't bust me. Because it's just a matter of time. You know, but he gives me space, he gives me time, and he, he lets me self-adjust, right? And he tells me, Christian, that was wrong, turn. And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. And when I don't, then with his loving kindness, he comes back. He says, Christian, turn from that. And then I don't do it. And then he comes back, and he says, Christian, turn from that. You know? And sometimes about the fourth time, you're like, I think God's saying something. <laughs> I think I hear the Spirit of the Lord, right? Um, but he doesn't strike me dead. But he says, and then he'll say, Christian, either you bust yourself or I'll bust you for I'll do it for you. <laughs> but you have some time to make a decision. Are you going to turn yourself in and repent and receive forgiveness and receive the refreshment of the Lord? Or, or do you want me to expose you to everybody? And so I'm like, no, please don't expose me. <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. But it's not just the words. You actually have to like stop doing that action, whatever the sin may be. And so you do that, and then you realize like, oh, Lord, look how nice you deal with me. Look how patient you were with me. So what do you think God expects of us? How should we handle other people? If we're Christians, if we're Christ-like, he expects us to handle other people the same way. Hey, brother and sister, please turn and give them space and pray for them. And come back, I love you so much. Please turn and please turn and be patient and be patient. You know, at some point it does come a time where even the Spirit of God doesn't always strive with men. There comes a time where he says, this is what you want, okay. Then that's, that's your decision, we're not gonna violate that. But just that loving kindness and that wooing back to the Lord. So don't misinterpret God's goodness that he doesn't necessarily correct us right away. He does chasten those who he loves, though. He loves you, so you will... Some people might steal time at work, you know, but you try to do it. You try to take a pen home, you know. Uh, I was 15 years old working at Burger King, you know, and uh, I don't even think I was a Christian back then, but... Um, the chili, the chili of Birkin was a dollar in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, as employees, we had to pay 50 cents, 50% 50 off. So I took my bowl of chili and I went to the, to the lunchroom and I had no intention to pay any money <laughs> whatsoever for this meal. <laughs> and Fred, our manager, came in. He's like, Christian, did you pay for that? And I was like, no, I, I was just about to. <laughs> no, I wasn't about to. I was about to eat it. That's what I was about to do. So I walked to the front and, oh man, here's my 50 cents. So I get my 50 cents. But that's God's love. He's going to bust you. You're not a Christian, you might get away with it. And you know what? Later, Fred, my manager, who busted me, who the Lord used to bust me, he was embezzling like $80,000 from Burger King. <laughs> so, you know, you see your own sins in other people, or you identify them really easily. Hey, you're stealing 50 cents? You can't steal. Never mind, I'm stealing 80,000. But I don't think it was a Christian anyways. But, but sometimes God 
corrects us right away. Sometimes he doesn't, but don't misinterpret that. He doesn't care, right? There's this guy who was, uh, there was, there was a church service, and this guy was working his field outside the church service every Sunday on his lawnmower, making noises as people were trying to preach and worship the Lord. Just, whoa, you know? And he kept doing it every Sunday. Just his land was right next to the church, and he's just working. And, uh, um, you know, he interpreted like, look, if God wanted me to be at church on Sunday, like, he has no problem with me. I'm working on Sunday. He's fine with me, you know. And uh, the preacher told, told the guy, you know, God doesn't set, settle his accounts in October. In other words, just because he hasn't settled his account with you and what you're doing, that doesn't mean he's not going to settle his account at some point. So don't misinterpret just because we're not busted immediately or God hasn't dealt with us. That don't, don't interpret that, that he will not do it at some point. There's a perfect time when God says, okay, now we're going to deal with this. And so um, don't come to the conclusion that doesn't care about your habitual sin. We all sin, right? But if there's a habitual sin, God does care about that. You can take the attitude, see, he hasn't done anything to me. If God really cares, why, don't, why wouldn't he stop me from being a habitual sinner? But the Bible teaches that God is giving me a new time to turn back to him, to turn from our sin and to do those things which please the Father. Now, we desire here at Calvary Chapel to have a ministry and to deal with each other with loving kindness because that's our God and we desire to be like him. And it's because of his goodness or his loving kindness that he leads us to repentance. And in verse 5 it says, But in accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who will, what is God going to do? He will render to each one according to his deeds. What's he going to do? Verse 7, eternal life, heaven, to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, on every soul man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is zero or no partiality with God. We are not living in the Old Testament. Therefore, this dispensation that we're living in, that the Lord has us in, is that God is dealing equally with all mankind. If you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, He will bless you and He is going to reward you. But if you harden your heart towards our Lord Jesus Christ and you decide to follow the path of your own life and you want to be the master of your own life, then God is going to judge you regardless of who you are or even regardless of what you believe. The Lord shows personal favoritism to no man. He loves us all equally as believers in Jesus Christ, and we all have the same access to Him through prayer and through the reading of His Word. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, but as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. So people who have never heard of the law of God or the Ten Commandments are going to be judged without the law, and as a matter of fact, the law of God was actually, the Bible says, written on their hearts. But those who have the law of God, who've seen the Ten Commandments, will be judged according to the law. Verse 13 says, For not the hearer of the law, just because you hear you shouldn't covet, just because you heard that, is just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For in Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, though not having the law, are law to themselves, who show the work of law written on their hearts. Their conscience also bear witness, and between themselves their, thought, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So the Bible does teach that God has written His law on every man's heart. He has built into us that consciousness and awareness of good and evil. It is innate in all of us, written in our hearts by God. And my conscience either excuses me or um, accuses me. Now, in all cultures, when an adult takes a knife to a one-year-old, 
and puts the knife on the kid's face and even harms the little child. You don't need the Ten Commandments to know in every culture that that is wrong. And that is done. And people know it's wrong. And they do that to little kids. There's kids who are rescued even before they're one years old. They've already been abused before the age of one. The adults know that that's wrong. And so they choose to do those things, but their conscience does not go away. God is there. It's written in their hearts. But for us, to whom much is given, much is required. We've been given much. We've been given the whole word of God. So you know that that's wrong. You know those things are wrong. There's many things that are just so obvious and so plain. And you're saying, those are wrong. It's written in our hearts. Even if you never read your Bible, you would know. It's not right to be a coward. It's not right to be a thief. It's not right to take advantage of somebody hopeless. We already know. How do we know? Because God already put that in our hearts. You know, somebody abuses an animal. You already know. Stop doing that. That's not, you know. Somebody goes and... Uh, takes advantage of an older lady at a grocery store, robs her, takes her purse, maybe hits her in the head. They do that stuff. And you as a person, you chase after that guy. You want to you beat him. Because you're like, it's not right what you're doing. You're taking advantage. Right? But why do you feel that way? The reason you feel that way, and the reason we want to make it right, is because God's law is written on your heart. It's just so obvious for you. You already know, you should not be taking advantage of the elderly. You should not be doing that kind of stuff. But to us, much was given. What has been given to us? The whole counsel of God, from Genesis to Revelation. And God requires that we are doers of the word, not hearers only, because if we're just hearing it, then we would be deceiving ourselves. And in the day when God will judge the secret of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, Paul says, this is what God will judge. God is going to judge the secrets of men. The test, based on what God will judge, will be the inner state of the heart and its attitude towards God and people in our everyday lives. And so there is hope because Jesus has already been judged for you. And Jesus has already taken your sins on the cross. And he did an uneven exchange he took our sins upon him and he imputes his righteousness unto your account as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so keep your heart open to Jesus. Accept he clothes you with his righteousness. When the Father looks at you, he doesn't see us for our sins. He sees us for Jesus' perfection because we're in Christ. Outside of Christ, there is no salvation outside of Christ. And God is not going to stop being just. He's not going to become crooked just to let you go into heaven without Jesus. If that was the case, he would have never sent his son to pay that heavy price in his blood. But he did that. And so our prayer this morning is that you realize, humans, how depraved we can be without the Lord. And so I pray that the Lord draws us closer to him every single day in his word, in prayer, in fellowship, in sharing, that we would accept by faith God's finished work for us on the cross. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be able to do the things of the law. We can't do it with our own strength. But when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you will have power. He gives you power to be a witness. He gives you power to trust Him. He gives you power not to sin. He gives you power not to be habitual. He gives you power to repent. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. You have written this down for us. These things are written for our learning. I pray that you, you would learn the things that you had for us today. I pray that we would be equipped as saints, Lord, for the work of the ministry. Lord, I ask that would you be everything that every single person in this room needs you to be for them. Lord, we all need you. Lord, I pray that you show yourself strong on behalf of your people. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, it was needful. I just pray that you bless your people, you watch over them. Fill them with your spirit, Lord, and that you just be honored and glorified. And Father, we tell you, in a way, happy Father's Day, Lord. You deserve it. 
Lord. You are our Father. Lord, we are your children. You are Abba Father, Lord. So we tell you, God, first and foremost, happy Father's Day. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand for our final song.